Once again, our reading from Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. You've probably seen the man holding the sign, Repent, the end is near. And it usually makes us a little bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? Even though we agree with the sign, like Jesus could come at any moment. And yes, people should turn from their sin and look to Jesus. That's true. Maybe we get a little uncomfortable because we assume some false teaching behind his holding the sign. Maybe we get uncomfortable because we're just a little judgmental and the way he's presenting himself just makes us uncomfortable. Maybe it makes us uncomfortable or guilty about our own evangelism efforts. He's out here telling people to repent and look to Jesus. What am I doing? to share Jesus in my life? Maybe we get uncomfortable as we second guess if we are really ready for the end to come, if we're really ready for Jesus to come back. That's a scary thought. John the Baptist was a little like that guy holding the sign. He came there. He was there in the wilderness telling people to repent. John's job was to prepare the way for Jesus, and that's how he did it. He went and told people to repent, to recognize their sin, turn from it, and look to God for forgiveness. John was sent to prepare the way. He was the fulfillment of Isaiah's words, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So, are we prepared for Jesus to come? Are we really prepared to celebrate his coming on Christmas? Are we prepared for his second coming when he will come back to judge the living and the dead? Are we prepared for our own personal judgment day, the unknown dates of our death? Are we prepared for Jesus to come? Isaiah tells us that we should prepare. He gives us the picture of a highway being built in the desert, which was a pretty ridiculous concept in Isaiah's day. You needed the major roadways to go near the town so that the people could go there to rest and their animals could load up with more food and water for the journey. Isaiah also gave the picture of mountains being leveled and valleys being filled in. We can appreciate what it takes to make a way through the mountains. 
Even with modern technology, it takes all kinds of blasting and clearing and rock slide prevention to make and maintain a way through the mountains. The point of these two pictures from Isaiah is that this is going to be big. The Lord is coming in a big way, and we should prepare to meet him. That's what John the Baptist was doing in the wilderness, telling people to repent. And there were some who rejected John and his message because they saw no need of repentance. They saw no sins of their own that needed to be forgiven. And then when Jesus came, many of them rejected Jesus too. Others listened to John, recognized their sin and need for a Savior, and then were baptized. And then when John pointed them to Jesus, when Jesus came, many of them went and followed Jesus as their Savior. We too are to prepare for Jesus' coming. And so we need to repent. We need to recognize our sins and our sinfulness. We need to listen to our fellow believers who expose a sin in our lives and not get so defensive. We need to recognize places in our lives where we may have grown comfortable in sin. We need to examine our lives and see where there might be sin there that we're not seeing and, and turn from it and look, look to God. We are to prepare. We are to repent. But then Isaiah also tells us that we are like grass, that our lives are fragile like grass. They could be ended at any moment by any number of things. And so if there's something we're holding on to in this world that makes us not want Jesus to come back just yet, how silly is that? Everyone and everything is like grass, here one day and gone the next in the grand scheme of things. If we have something promised to us that God says will last forever, his word, well then we should be holding on to that with all of our hope. Even as we are here in church preparing for Jesus to come at Christmas, even as we daily turn from sin to God in our lives, even as we try to live for God, still God tells us that our faithfulness is like a flower. Not that it's beautiful like a flower, but that it's frail and temporary like a flower. And so this repentance that we do is never perfect. We've never turned from sin once and for all to God and then lived a perfect life after that. Our repentance is imperfect. And so as we are told to prepare for Jesus to come and we prepare by repenting, we know that repentance is always imperfect. So are we really ready for Jesus to return? Is the answer Maybe. It depends if I've turned from sin that day to God. It depends if I've really been trying to live for God recently. That's a scary thought. But your God comes to you, not harshly, to see exactly how you've been living recently and then base your salvation on that. No, we see in Isaiah exactly how our God comes to us. Our God comes to us to announce comfort and to remind us that we are his people. Isaiah originally relayed these words from God towards his people who were living in exile. They were living in exile because of their own turning to sin against God. They had done that so many times that God sold his people away into exile. But even there, even then, God comes to his people to announce comfort, to remind them that they were still his people. We see how God comes to us. Here is your God. We heard it last week 
how Jesus came to us, gentle and riding on a donkey. He rode into Jerusalem to save us. And so we see Jesus, the grown man, riding on an adolescent donkey, humble. Here is your God. During Advent, we get ready to see our God born into the world. The endless, all-powerful God of the universe lowered himself to be a helpless baby, born to parents who didn't have the money or power even to demand a bed for their son on his first day of life. Jesus did that so that he could one day die on the cross to take away all of your sins. And so we look into the manger and see this helpless baby. Here is your God. We hear John the Baptist call Jesus uh, the Lamb of God who can't, comes to take away the sin of the world. Jesus doesn't come harshly to demand more from us. He came to take all of our imperfections and our repentance that hasn't been so great onto himself and die on the cross for them. And so we look at the cross and see Jesus passively taking the punishment for sins he didn't commit. Here is your God. We see how our God comes to us throughout this section of Isaiah. He comes to us to announce comfort, and he doesn't say it just once. He really wants us to get the picture. Comfort, comfort. He reminds us that we are his people. Despite our turnings to sin against him, despite our lack of faithfulness and our imperfect repentance, he still calls us his very own people. God wants his people spoken to tenderly. He doesn't want his good message lost in the delivery. Here is your God. He cares that much that you receive this comfort from him. Our God comes to announce that your hard service is over. Your salvation is so certain in God's eyes that it's like there's no more suffering to be done on this earth anymore. In God's eyes, your sin is so paid for, so forgiven in Jesus, that it's like there is no struggle over temptation and sin. Our God doesn't want you to think of your sins as barely being forgiven or salvation barely being won for you. No, he says whatever your sin is, God's paid double for it. Grace is overflowing for you. You have more than enough of God's favor to get you to the end. Our God knows that we are like grass, that our lives are frail and fragile. But Isaiah tells us elsewhere that Jesus came as one who wouldn't break a bruised reed. He comes gentle, not harshly to demand more from us, but instead he came to do it all for us and give us the credit. Here is your God. Our God comes and calls you his reward. You are that special to God that you are a reward to him. He won your soul from sin by dying on the cross for you so that he could be with you forever. Our God chose to picture himself as a shepherd who holds you, his lamb, in his arms like a baby. Here is your God. How could we not be overjoyed to prepare to meet him? How could we not humble ourselves to recognize our sins and sinfulness before him who humbled himself for us? How could we not want to turn from the sin in our lives that Jesus says is already forgiven? We don't have to make excuses for our sins as if God is going to come to us harshly when we sin. No, our God comes to us with comfort, 
to give us the forgiveness of sins, to remind us that we are still his people. And God doesn't just want this announcement of comfort announced here in this building. He wants this announcement of comfort announced out there to other people who need that comfort too. Look at how loving and forgiving and gentle and amazing your God is. We naturally want to share this news about Jesus to other people. God doesn't picture evangelism as, you know, being forced to preach to other people how they need to live or be condemned. No, instead, God pictures it like this. He gives us the comfort of forgiveness in Jesus so that we can give other people that same comfort too. We see how our God comes to us. He could come to us any way he wanted. He could come with judgments and punishments and more demands. That's not how our God comes to us, his people. When I think about that man holding the sign, repent, the end is near. I think sometimes I get uncomfortable because of the picture it paints of God. That he is a harsh judge and you better do something before he gets here or he's going to get you. And it's true that our God is a judge who will condemn those who reject Jesus and the forgiveness he won on the cross. But that's not who God is towards me. And that's not who God is towards you either. Your God loves you. Your God is the kind of God who comes to you and says things like, do not be afraid, and gives you the reason not to be afraid. Jesus, who was sent to save you. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Here is your God. Amen.